Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Katie Hoppler. And I'm Asami Dustin. We are both students here at the University of New Hampshire, and today it's our pleasure to be your MCs for this exciting event. Thank you all for being here with us this afternoon, and we hope you find some comfort in our new virtual environment. Today, we are celebrating two of UNH's annual signature events, the New Hampshire Social Venture Innovation Challenge, as well as the Social Innovator of the Year Award. These annual programs, now celebrating their eighth year, embody our mission as the state's flagship public university as a land, sea, and space grant institution focused on the public good. We are proud to represent just two of thousands of change makers here at our university. What do we mean by change makers? Well, we define change makers as those who are motivated to help counter the world's most pressing social issues. And of course, 2020 has shown that the need for constructive and collaborative solutions is more necessary now than ever. Locally, nationally, and globally, light has been shed on both new and long lasting crises. Economic collapses, the fight against climate change, racial inequity and injustice, and of course the pandemic are just a few examples of this. And Katie and I are hopeful that as change makers, we will help disrupt the underlying conditions that cause and maintain these societal challenges. We are not alone. Our generation places a high priority on careers which allow them to do work that has a positive impact on society. We see ourselves as future leaders who will tackle the world's sustainability challenges. And frankly, we are a generation that is demanding a new type of education. We are not looking for an education to simply receive a job that interests us or to make some stable money. We are prioritizing an experiential education that aligns with our values too and helps lead us to our goal of creating structural changes. This is one of the reasons we are so proud of and excited about UNH's Changemaker Collaborative. The Changemaker Collaborative is a partnership of UNH's Sustainability Institute, the Peter T. Paul College of Business and Economics, and the Carsey School of Public Policy, and serves students at New Hampshire from all colleges and all majors. The Collaborative brings together students, faculty, staff, for-profit and non-profit businesses, and government agencies committed to advancing positive change. It's here that the next generation of ambitious, daring, and empathetic leaders are supported through real world experiences, while community partners are helped to advance their own sustainability initiatives. The Changemaker Collaborative offers a suite of high impact educational programs, such as internships, fellowships, consulting, research projects, and other leadership opportunities to students from across UNH looking to effectively tackle the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We know firsthand that these programs complement knowledge gained to the classroom and meaningfully advance more sustainable communities locally and beyond. To make this more concrete, Masami and I would like to tell you about how we are involved as change makers. So I am a senior this year, a business management major in Paul College. And I like to think I've always sort of been a change maker. I've always wanted to help people and for years thought of ways I could incorporate this into my profession. But it wasn't until Semester in the City, a Boston-based fellowship program offered by the Collaborative, that I began to understand what impactful change really was and who actually needs it the most. Throughout that semester, my classes challenged me to learn about real systematic inequalities and the structures upholding and enforcing them. For my fellowship, I was hosted by Family Aid Boston, a nonprofit service provider for homeless families where I worked as a project coordinator reporting to the president. By expanding my mindset on widespread social issues while concurrently putting to practice all of this new knowledge, I began to see the world in a different way. As a child, I didn't comprehend what social issues really were. But as an Asian American growing up in an almost entirely white town and state, I did recognize that I was never looked at the same as my peers were. Though I wasn't sure why for many years, I knew how it made me feel. Disconnected, indifferent, and I didn't want other people to have to feel the same way regardless of their distinctive qualities. This semester showed me that even with the racial based challenges I dealt with in the past and still deal with now, how lucky I am compared to so many others. The undeserved privileges I do have of being cisgender male, having financial stability growing up and other things out of my personal control are core reasons to why I had this amazing opportunity in the first place. I know now that millions of other Americans will never get the chance I have got. And my hope is to change that, to use my inherent privilege for the welfare of other minority groups and therefore the betterment of our community as a whole. This has led me to working with the Changemaker Collaborative as a coach mentoring several incredibly bright, like-minded first year students and as a recruiter for the program that taught me so much. I'm thankful to do these things too while continuing my work with Family Aid Boston as a paid part-time employee 
after having worked there full time this past summer, especially with the ongoing consequences and battle against the pandemic's severe health and economic implications for homeless families. Thank you so much, Masami, and for all the amazing work you've done at UNH. I'm a third year student at the University of New Hampshire with a double major in journalism and economics. At first glance, these two majors do not seem to be related whatsoever. However, my involvement with the Beat Incock Clinic through the Changemaker Collaborative allowed me to perfectly combine my diverse set of skills into a cohesive experience that drives social change. As a student consultant in the Beat Impact Clinic, I am currently helping the sustainable and ethical seafood company, Luke's Lobsters, gain recertification as a Beat Corporation. My experience with the clinic has shown me that the skills developed in my various academic settings can be transferred into tangible actions. The B Corporation assessment is rigorous and challenges companies to create a social and environmental change. It pushes them to do what is best for the world. Through it, I learned that capitalism can be used as a force for good. My time in the clinic exposed me to companies and professionals working towards a more sustainable future and truly inspires me to one day do the same. Thanks so much, Katie. Now that you all know us a little better, we want to move to a key part of today's event, which is to hear from, honor, and award UNH's Annual Social Innovator of the Year. This award recognizes leaders with a demonstrated commitment to combining the passion and purpose of a social or environmental mission <clears throat> with the rigor and accountability of a financially sustainable, scalable model for change. Over the years, we've honored some amazing leaders, and I just want to give a quick special shout out to our past recipients. We are delighted to celebrate the eighth anniversary of this prestigious award and introduce today's speaker, Anne Finucane. Anne Finucane graduated from UNH in 1974 as an English major. Today, she is the vice chairman of Bank of America and the chairman of the board for Bank of America Europe. As an English major myself, it is very exciting for me to see someone like Anne in such an impactful and influential position, using her liberal arts training as a corporate leader, driving sustainable change. It's particularly meaningful to me to have such a strong role model in the field of financial services because I have a part-time job as a teller at a local financial institution. As a member of the executive management team, Anne is responsible for the strategic positioning of Bank of America and leads the company's environmental, social and governance, sustainable finance, capital deployment, and public policy efforts. Most recently, in the midst of the pandemic and racial turmoil in the country, Ms. Finucane spearheaded the work around Bank of America's $1 billion four-year initiative to accelerate work and advance economic opportunity, healthcare initiatives, and racial equality. As the chairman of the board of Bank of America Europe, the firm's EU bank headquartered in Dublin, Finucane oversees more than 60 billion euro in assets. She chairs the global ESG committee at Bank of America, which directs all the company's ESG efforts. She also co-chairs the Sustainable Market Committee with COO Tom Montag, which collaborates across business lines to deliver innovative financing solutions and support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We'll learn more about Bank of America's commitment to the SDGs in Anne's keynote today. It's also inspiring to me to see that as a corporate leader, Anne is also very active in the community. She serves on a variety of corporate and nonprofit boards of directors. Additionally, Anne was recently nominated for the second time to serve as one of the World Bank Group's WeFi Leadership Champions, representing the United States, where she champions the empowerment of women entrepreneurs in a developing context. Previously, she served on the U.S. State Department's Foreign Affairs Policy Board and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Unsurprisingly, Anne has received numerous professional and public service accolades. She's regularly been named to Forbes and Fortune's Most Powerful Women's List, along with American Bankers' 25 Most Powerful Women in Banking. We can't wait to hear a keynote dialogue today. We are also very happy that the moderator of today's dialogue is our own amazing leader, James W. Dean Jr., University of New Hampshire's 20th president. Jim came to UNH in 2018 after more than 30 years of experience in public higher education. Before joining UNH, he served as the executive vice chancellor and provost at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and previously as dean of the business school as a professor of organizational behavior. Before we hand over to Hand and Jim, I want to mention that we will have time for Q&A from the audience, so please enter your questions in the Zoom Q&A function at any time during the keynote. So now, please join us in welcoming Anne Finucan and President Jim Dean. Thank you so much. Thank you, Masami, and thank you, Katie. I uh, really appreciate that introductory material and the background on UNH and about yourselves personally, so thank you so much for that. Uh, and welcome to the last I checked our over 500 participants on this webinar. So we're really just thrilled with the turnout. 
and I'm glad that everybody was able to uh, was able to join us today. So uh, uh, let's start with Anne. So Anne, congratulations on your award. As you know, one of UNH's most prestigious honors, and we're very proud and grateful to have you join us today. Uh, we'll spend a lot of time talking about your work at Bank of America and the kinds of things that Masami and Katie have talked about. But I wonder if we might first go back to your student days at UNH. Uh, we know that you didn't necessarily expect to pursue a business career when you were an undergraduate, and yet look at you now. <laughs> so I, I wonder uh, if there are any ways in which the, a class that you took or an experience at UNH or friends that you made in any way helped to shape your career path. Well, I'm sure all of that helped to shape my career path, but let me begin by congratulating uh, Katie and um, um, Sami and for you, Jim, and particularly for the uh, Platinum Stars rating that uh, UNH has achieved. That's uh, quite remarkable. And um, I'm sure that we'll see more out of the Sustainability Institute as well. So for all of those and many more reasons, I feel very proud to be uh, a, uh, an alumni of, of UNH. So my time at UNH was a little different. It was at a very different time and place in American history. It was in the wake of uh, the assassinations of um, Martin Luther King and, and Bobby Kennedy and the riots uh, throughout the country. So uh, coming into a university setting it was uh, just a very different time. There was a lot of uh, dissent regarding the Vietnam War. There was a lot of dissent politically. And so that really played a part in every university, including UNH. For me personally, I'm afraid I was not a leader. You've heard me say that before. I was uh, more focused on what I was doing with my own life and um, sometimes bu uh, bumping into walls on that itself. So. Uh, uh, for all of you who um, are not sure that you have a, the road forward and a clear path, I'm here to tell you and, and exhibit one that you can get there. Uh, so I took liberal arts. I started as a fine arts major. Uh, I think I've shared with some of you that uh, after a couple of classes, I had some talent, but not nearly the talent I saw from some of the students around me. And I felt that I would never be able to compare no matter how much I tried. And at my father's request, I had kept another major, uh, English. He wanted to see a liberal arts background. And um, I did flourish in American literature and English. And I enjoyed not only that, but the rest of what you would get in liberal arts language, uh, behavioral sciences, history, etc. And I will say that I think that uh, what I missed in terms of accounting and economics, both of which I thought now I should have taken uh, and had to learn on the job, but what I did learn is critical thinking, uh, the ability to listen and know how to write. And those are skills that have carried me effectively throughout my professional career. Wonderful, thank you so much for that, Ian. Uh, so let's turn to, to Bank of America. If we open up the Bank of America website today under who we are, it says the following. At Bank of America, we have a clear purpose to help make financial lives better through the power of every connection. We fulfill this purpose through our commitment to responsible growth, which includes a focus on environmental, social, and governance, or ESG leadership. So this focus being so high and prominent on your website might come as a surprise to people outside the business community. So how was it that the Bank of America leadership team chose to embrace social innovation and ESG and to uh, make sure that your business practices were aligned along those lines? Well, I think it's important to set context. Uh, 10 years ago, the financial services industry was held in very low regard. Uh, we were just emerging from the financial crisis and um, the dynamics between banks, regulators, shareholders, and customers was uh, suboptimal at best. And so uh, we really had to look at ourselves and look at every bit of our uh, operation, meaning uh, the treatment of our employees, our connection to shareholders, what we were doing in the community, uh, what, um, what our services and practices would be on a go forward basis. And when you're actually that broken, 
it is an opportunity to just take a look at yourself and say, how much of this are we willing to change? And we decided we would seek to change all of it. Not so much because the company was in complete disarray, but because so much of what was good about us had been lost in those years of 2008, nine and 10, that there was uh, impetus for us to restate what our value proposition was to all those constituencies. And in doing so, it makes you think it through. What kind of um, services are you going to provide? What kind of training are you going to give to your people? What kind of minimum wage are you going to offer that nobody would be behind, below the poverty line that would be in your own company? What kind of maternity, paternity uh, leave? What will you do to make an LGBTQ uh, audience and, and uh, workforce feel good about you? Um, what could you do in terms of diversity? So we've worked on all of those things and that sort of makes up our ESG framework of looking at not just what we're doing environmentally, but our social contract with all of those audiences. And just to fast forward to today, um, we are more successful today than we were 10 years ago. We're more focused than we were. We have much higher uh, client and customer satisfaction, much lower uh, employee attrition, from a third party perspective, we have a, a, a much better reputation and we are seen as being number one or two in all the businesses we're in. So I'd say that that's a pretty good comeback. <laughs> I'll say very impressive comeback. So there's there's very little change. And one of the themes of today is change makers. We've been using that word a lot. And there's very little change that happens in any organization, especially not one the size of Bank of America without some skepticism and some resistance. So I'm not going to ask the question, was there any? I'm just going to say, so what was it like and how did you address it? Well, certainly there was plenty of it. Uh, but now you're tearing apart um, sort of all the constructs and rebuilding. We put together a new management team. The management team looked more diverse than the one that had preceded it. Uh, and that helped because when you have diversity around the table, um, it raises questions. And as soon as you raise a question and you have to explain yourself, it's, it opens the window in a room and, and a lot more happens. So that was the first thing. The second was prove it. So uh, we had to prove some things. If we reduced the fees to clients and trained our people better and uh, paid them better, uh, would we actually get better results? Because there's a whole history that says that doesn't happen, but it did happen. Mm -hmm. uh, fewer customers, more satisfied customers, and uh, better trained employees who felt more comfortable themselves. That's sort of on the basics. In terms of community outreach, uh, we were good on affordable housing and community development. That had been a long legacy of Bank of America but we could be more contemporary in it. Meaning, could we apply what we did in affordable housing, something we were good at, uh, and insert uh, green aspects so that in the building of, a, of a, a development, it would be environmentally sound. We would be looking for green spaces. We would make sure there wasn't a food desert. Could you look at things holistically? So uh, the first one was hard to do. It took longer than I'd like. It probably cost more than it should have, but we've been able to reproduce that since much more effectively. And then when it comes to the environment itself, um, I would go all the way back to 2004. We had decided to do a uh, building. We were gonna seek to get lead platinum status. Uh, that takes quite a bit to do. It was uh, going to be our signature skyscraper in New York at One Bryant Park. It took longer to construct. It had issues with it in terms of potable water and uh, the use of solar and a, a bunch of things that you hope will work and at first didn't work. But eventually it did work. We opened the building. It was and is the first platinum lead skyscraper in the world. And that gave confidence, I think, to the rest of the company that these things are not only possible, but they're not uh, off subject, they're on subject, they're, they're key and core, not uh, sort of parallel worlds. Well, that's a, a really good explanation. I, I appreciate that. 
you know, one of the, as you know, one of the oldest sort of, I don't know, argument or discussions around sustainability is this whole issue about doing well and doing good. I think it's pretty clear from the answers you've given us so far that you believe that those two are pretty closely aligned. Um, is there anything more that you want to say on that topic? No, other than, you know, there are the uh, economists, well-known economists that say that uh, b uh, banks and all companies should just be focused on shareholder return. And that's probably uh, true, but a shareholder is also a citizen of the world, a member of a community, uh, a member of a family, uh, straight or gay, white or a person of color. They, they, they aren't just one thing. And um, if you think in those terms in a multiplicity of ways when you're making decisions, uh, you, you are looking at shareholder returns, but you're also looking at that shareholder as needing to live in comfort, uh, needing to live in an environmentally sound environment, needing to be able to breathe air and, be, and remain healthy. It's just a little more holistic in our approach. And again, our uh, returns and our stock price improved with these efforts. They, didn't, they weren't diminished. We didn't have extraordinary expense and no returns. Mm -hmm. no, that's really encouraging. And you know from our conversation recently that the investments that the university has made with endowed funds in the ESG platform have done much better than the conventional return. So one more data point that they're, that they're aligned. And I congratulate you for that. And I hope you do more of it. You know, initially that wasn't true. So initially when any of us that got into um, sustainable investing know they weren't uh, driving higher returns. They are now. And in fact, there's about $51 trillion of, of uh, professionally managed institutional in investments in the United States. About 17 trillion of those are, are um, have ESG qualities to them. I'm not sure I'd call them fully ESG, but they certainly have some qualities to them. And I think eventually they all will because as we move forward and people recognize the science of, of climate change, but probably more importantly, uh, they start to feel health issues or weather issues uh, or f food insecurity or droughts. You know, those are pretty motivating. I wonder if we could change topics just a little bit and talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, these are, are not new concepts. You have been working on them for quite some time. We've been working on them for quite some time. I wonder if you could give any specifics about the work that the bank has done, uh, whether it be in racial areas or you've mentioned LGBTQ a couple of times. And there's, there's many dimensions. Just give us some specific examples of the kinds of things you've worked on there. Well, with our own people, our own employees, we have a saying that we want people to come to work comfortable as who they are and then make it comfortable for them to come to work. And I will tell you that in, in practicing that rather than just saying it, the, the talent pool we've been able to pull from has been that much greater. And I'm very proud of the people that work at the company because uh, we are a diverse lot, and it also means that we have more robust conversations and you can check your thinking, which there is no point in your career that you, you don't want to uh, the ability to check your thinking and to be a listener. So I'd say that's sort of fundamental piece of it. Uh, when you're interviewing, we try to make sure that the slate of uh, people we're interviewing are diverse in all sorts of ways. And then uh, more externally, we've done a couple of things that I think have made enough news that it's worth maybe repeating. One is a $1 billion commitment uh, in the wake of the death of uh, George Floyd and Breonna T uh, Taylor and others. Just what could we do? Uh, it was actually an effort we had already begun, but what could we do to uh, jumpstart some efforts in very practical ways? So it isn't that we will spend a billion dollars on this. If you measure it up 30 years, uh, I don't know, five years from now, it would be 30 billion. It, these are sort of fire starter kinds of things. So um, 
putting investments into minority deposit institutions. These are uh, credit institutions or banks at a local level. They're owned and operated by the minority community. So Black, Hispanic, Asian American, Native American, uh, where we put equity into their bank and therefore they can lend more. We also put deposits in so they can lend more at a community level. We've worked with 21 um, uh, academic institutions, half of them are community colleges. We create a training program in conjunction with the community college, and we then work together to place the students that go through it in jobs. Many of them are our jobs, but we also try to make a connection with other good employers in the area so that it is not only a job, but like the beginning of a career. And then we work with hist historically black institutions and Hispanic serving institutions. And with them, we're, those are four year colleges and we're working with them to do um, you know, interview training, to do recruiting, to get other, uh, other banks and other uh, corporations onto campus. This is a bad year for it since it's virtual, but in the longer term onto campus to recruit. Uh, we're doing something in the area of healthcare, working with community hospitals and then community groups, whether it's a boys and girls club or a homeless shelter, of getting masks and sanitizer and gloves there so that you're reducing uh, the disease of COVID. And then uh, right now we're working with CVS to offer vaccines for the flu. And we hope once. Uh, the COVID vaccine is available then again to offer that for those that are in an uninsured. So those are some examples. Uh, th those are great, great examples, and thank you for that. I'm gonna just go off script for a second. I, I know that you, there's just such a wide range of things that the bank has done and you've given us a really good sampling of them already. I wonder if I could ask you just a little more personally of all of these uh, areas that you work in, is there any one in particular that that really gives you a sense of personal satisfaction, something that you find personally really meaningful? Well, I find it all pretty meaningful. I, what I find meaningful is that we've been able to get it done. And that means that you're not like Sisyphus. You aren't rolling that rock up the hill and then it's rolling back down on you. You, you are uh, embraced and buoyed by the people that are with you so that you're actually doing more than I thought we could do. So that's, really encouraging. For me personally, the work we're doing on sustainability, I'm very interested in and very proud of, uh, meaning uh, what we've been able to do in green bonds and uh, tax equity uh, financing. These are, these are uh, financial instruments, but they're financial instruments that let universities or businesses or whoever uh, uh, retrofit their company or their factory or their organization to uh, have uh, much more sustainable uh, and renewable energy. We, we are uh, ourselves carbon neutral. It takes a while to get to carbon neutrality, as you know. Uh, I've seen everything that you've done. And if you have you know, a broad campus uh, buying renewable energy or creating uh, renewable or self-sustaining use of potable water and all that, that takes a lot. And at first it's an expense. So that can be financed. So that's good for a bank. And then over time, what you've got is carbon neutrality on its way someday to be net zero. And it's a, a world that our kids can flourish in rather than a parched earth, no food, bad water, bad air. I mean, what kind of legacy is that? <laughs> Not a very good one, for sure. Uh, skipping ahead a little bit, just in the interest of time, we have just about 10 minutes left. Uh, one of the questions I thought I was looking forward to asking you about is, have your experiences in EF, ESG uh, helped you to prepare for and respond to the COVID pandemic? I mean, on the face of it, maybe not so closely related, but I wonder if the lessons that you've learned around ESG have helped you to be are uh, better in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, but it's not the only thing. I mean, I, I think that the uh, prelude to COVID was 9-11, Sandy, uh, uh, Katrina, uh, the financial crisis itself, 
so that these series of, of very unrelated but nonetheless immediate moments that make you uh, need to come together and act very quickly has been a um, very good practice for this. And what I mean by that is we didn't hesitate to recognize that there are certain um, conditions we needed to put forward to our own people first. That is, no one would lose their job in 2020. If you could work from home, great. If you couldn't work from home, you would still be paid. And for those that were coming into the office, we tried to do some additional things because banks are considered an essential service, which means you have to keep the trading floor open and you have to keep the uh, branches open. Not all of them, but many of them. And then um, what we learned through uh, like Sandy, Hurricane Sandy and the other hurricanes in Houston, et cetera, were, and then Katrina before that, was also because now people would be home, maybe they could work from home, but their kids were home and their uh, caregivers uh, weren't available. So we gave people for the first six months, $100 a day for anybody that needed it to take care of their children. And they could hire sister, brother, neighbor, anybody uh, to help. Uh, with that effort. And I know, you know, then you've got the social distancing part, but we did seem to be able to work that out. We set up a pretty robust situation around telemedicine to help people get um, health care. We set up an emergency fund for our employees so that uh, if you're working, but your significant other isn't, or even a roommate isn't, and the two of you are paying the rent, we would try to help you with that. That wouldn't be a loan. That would just be just trying to help you out. Uh, and then mental health issues that have really become, after time, pretty enduring for people. And uh, we do everything from there's on our intranet site, there's a, a meditation classes uh, and uh, also just uh, help with connecting people to mental health experts. So again, just going off script for a second, I mean, you're talking about some, even for Bank of America, some pretty important financial investments, uh, pretty significant. So you must have a board that's very supportive of this direction. And I wonder if you comment on that a little bit. A lot of people on the call are probably members of boards and would be interested in that. Well, yes. So to go back to what you said to the beginning, our positioning is to help people with their financial lives through the power of every connection we can make with them. We apply the concept of ESG, and we talk about a strategy of responsible growth, which means we're going to, we are going to grow. We're going to be a successful company. We do have shareholders. They expect a return. No shareholder will get the kind of return they've gotten uh, this year, other than maybe Amazon and like companies. But for, for most of us, it will not be a stellar year, but your shareholders are not usually in for a quarter or two. They're, um, in for a long time, particularly institutional investors. So uh, the board knows that and the board looks for consistency and delivery. And we've been consistent in our delivery. As I said earlier, our employee scores are better and lower attrition. Our client and customer scores are better and lower attrition. They do more with us than they did before. Uh, we have fewer run-ins with regulators. Our legal fees are down. Our reputation is up uh, and that makes for a company that from a sustainability point of view has a very good future ahead of it. So they like it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I guess that goes back to the doing well and doing good question as well. That right. as as they're aligned. Wonderful. Uh, so you've had, of course, a both a successful but also a demanding career and yet you have always found time to give back. In addition to your engagement, including today with UNH, which we really appreciated, uh, you've contributed your talents to corporate and nonprofit boards. Uh, I'm curious about how you choose the causes that you get involved in and uh, how important that is to you. Well, in addition to the work on ESG and sustainability, I have a big interest in the arts. So uh, that sort of stems from those early days of being less inadequate as an artist, but it's not, nonetheless loving it. Um, so I have maintained uh, my board membership on Carnegie Hall. Uh, it's music, not visual, but uh, I love it. Uh, 
I am committed to Special Olympics. That's a long-term commitment that the bank made before I got here. But I have a daughter that has learning disability. She's not a Special Olympian. She's actually a college graduate. But I saw the difficulty she had um, as a young girl in terms of fitting in, et cetera. And so while the, the magnitude of her, of her issues was not as great, uh, I certainly am sensitized to the need to reach out and make someone feel included. And nobody does a better job than Special Olympics. So those are two examples. And then lastly, uh, my relationship with Mass General and Brigham and Women's and McLean's hospitals in the Boston area, uh, it keeps me up to speed and up to date. And um, it has been helpful in my professional career as well, so. Wonderful. No, I, you're, you're such a great role, mo role model along that dimension as well. So we're down to probably just about the last question. And I know we have a lot of young alumni and current students who are with us for the call. And you must get asked this question at least once a week, if not every day. But what sort of advice do you give to young people who are just starting out on their career, uh, especially recognizing this is a pretty challenging time to start a career? Uh, what thoughts would you like to share with our students and our young alumni? Well, keep your network of friends up. Uh, I graduated in a particularly bad uh, time, was sort of in the wake of a recession. Had I not had a, a good friend who lives in New Hampshire uh, uh, know of a job and try to help me get it, I wouldn't have gotten it. So I think um, you keep a network of friends up, you keep your resume out, you uh, eat your pride and see as many people as you can so that uh, if there's an opportunity, you take it. Uh, I think that be a listener, not just a talker. People talk a lot, I'm talking a lot now, but normally uh, I, I would take the time to try to listen because in listening, you often find out contextually what else might be available, which you didn't think about before hearing something out. So be open to uh, change. I had hoped when I graduated from University of New Hampshire to take a year off and then I would go to graduate school and I intended to do one of two things. I would either run a gallery or become an English professor. I am neither. Um, some things in my life got in the way uh, and I got a job uh, first in the uh, Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs and that's thanks to my friend and uh, I parlayed that into a job at a local television station as the creative services director, and then into advertising as an executive producer of you know, short films, TV commercials, et cetera. And from there into account management. That The track I just gave you, even though it's sort of the same uh, communications, that, that's not even normal. For every job I had, I wasn't really looking for the next job. I just saw I tried to learn something there that I might be able to apply later. And uh, I think I had the humility to know I wasn't as good as some other people, but I'm not sure everybody else knew that. So I would just try really hard. <laughs> that's that's a, a great and humble answer for someone of your uh, accomplishments. So this is a, a tough question to ask on uh, answer on the spot, but we've got just a couple of minutes left. So you've mentioned visual art and your interest in visual art. You've mentioned music. You said you're on the board at Carnegie Hall. And you also mentioned literature, that you studied literature when you were a student. Is there any particular work of art, whether it be a visual art, whether it be a piece of music, or perhaps a book that you've read somewhere along the line that, uh, that you really found meaningful and that is important to you as a person? Recognizing it's an unfair question off the top of your head. I don't think there is any off the top of my head. I mean, I love art. Um, I like the Impressionist masters, but I like contemporary art as well. And um, actually my home has got more contemporary art than it has uh, anything from a century ago. I obviously, because of um, Carnegie, I have a pretty good uh, relationship to, to classical music. I like Beethoven, I like Mahler, but uh, I also like rock and roll. So, uh, and maybe more. And um, uh, I forget the books. I'm, I, I read a book all the time. So it just uh, depends on, you know, 
fiction, nonfiction. I do, I have a, a deal with myself. If I read a work of fiction, the next will be nonfiction. I actually have the same deal with myself. That's interesting that we both independently struck on that. So if we write an article about this interview, it's going to be called Beethoven, Mahler, and Rock and Roll. I think. <laughs> <laughs> that one just writes itself. Well, and uh, thank you so much. This has been a great and enjoyable conversation. Uh, on behalf of the university, I want to thank you for sharing your time and your insights with us and with now uh, almost 600 members of the alumni community. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next year, maybe in person, fingers crossed uh, that that can happen. But in the meantime, we wish you and your family the best of everything. And uh, we will now turn it back over to our student leaders who are going to moderate a Q&A conversation with our participants. So thank you, Ann. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Ann and President Jim Dean, for an incredibly enlightening conversation. Um, that was really illuminating, and I certainly look forward to hearing some more from you, Ann. So for the next 10 or so minutes, we'd love to invite questions from the audience. Um, please continue to add your question into the Zoom webinar Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. So Ann, our first question is, what is the role that you see university endowments playing in driving investments to ESG and helping drive society towards a more sustainable future? In particular, is there any reason why universities like UNH shouldn't manage 100% of their endowments through an ESG lens? Well, I wouldn't want to mandate what anybody was doing. I think that, as I mentioned, uh, I think about a third or more of yours is currently in ESG, and that's about the same as uh, the broader universe. Over time, I think you're gonna have more and more in ESG because there'll be, um, to get to net zero, uh, the fossil fuels will begin to fall off over time. But remember right now, the world is fueled in some way or another, but about 80% of it is fossil fuel. So the, the wiser decision is to help the fossil fuel companies with the transition, at least that's my view. So if you were to get out of a fossil fuel that was making a transition, all you're doing is choking them uh, and they don't make the transition. So I, that's my point of view. I think you do as much as you can on pure ESG and then you try to help those that are willing to transition to transition. Thank you so much, Dan. The next question kind of follows up on what you just said, but it is how has Bank of America worked to implement climate risk reporting within its portfolio? Uh, that's a very wonky question. Um, so we have a risk framework that we operate within, and then we report out through uh, for the person asked familiar with SASB, TCFD, GRI, CDP. For the rest of you, these are initials to uh, sort of standard setters where you, you submit all your information and they essentially grade you. Um, so GRI and I, we're graded very, uh, probably the highest in any, fin as, uh, any financial services company. Uh, but we, we too have room to grow. And I should mention, because it's been raised somewhere else, uh, there was a question about whether Bank of America was doing um, drilling in the Arctic. We are not. Uh, so there was a issue around would banks uh, refuse to or withstand any kind of pressure to do project finance uh, financing in of Arctic drilling in the Arctic. Uh, we don't do it anyway. So I, I, I think that we probably uh, should have been more assertive, but since we didn't do it, we, we didn't make an affirmation of it. Yesterday, we made an affirmation of it so that it would be clear that Bank of America uh, will not do project finance, uh, for, will not project finance Arctic drilling in the Arctic or, or any other kind of um, sort of uh, tender in, environmental condition. Awesome, thank you. The next question is, what contrast have you seen between the US and Europe in embracing sustainable practices and what successful innovative practices have been adapted in European countries that the US would do well to consider? 
Well, I think the biggest thing that's happened in Europe is that they're passing legislation and they'll soon have regulation. So it's the Green Deal. It doesn't look anything like the Green Deal that was proffered by members of Congress uh, earlier in the year. But what it does do is it requires uh, multinationals and smaller companies to um, create a roadmap to get to net zero. In other words, they don't emit uh, carbon and none of their um, ancillary effects do either. So your employees don't, your vendors don't. In the case of um, banks, it's, it's quite uh, daunting because we would have to get to a point where none of our clients did either. So it takes a long time. Anyway, that, that effort is, is um, geared to 2050 with um, sort of a halfway point at 2030 or 2035, depending where they come out, because that hasn't been determined. But once that happens, it will actually set in motion a real carbon market. It will set in motion both uh, heavy regulation, but a lot of opportunity, because if you're, a, if you're a company that's trying to get to net zero, just not to get too science oriented, but there are three scopes to get there. Scope one and two are the things you do in your own entity. So what you've been doing on campus uh, through your sustainability is you have vendors and you have uh, students, you'd have to do that for them too. So um, th they are coming up with both carrots and sticks the regulation is the stick, the carrot is probably some tax incentive to get there sooner. If you're a multinational, you'll try to get there. So if you're an American multinational operating in Europe, and most multinationals are operating in Europe, you'll get there quicker because you don't want to do something in uh, Europe and then something else in the US. So I'm pretty optimistic. I think I'm even more optimistic that uh, with Joe Biden and the Biden administration coming in and having announced uh, their recommitment to the Paris Climate Agreement and to net zero and uh, appointing John Kerry as the climate czar, I think we'll see real momentum. That's amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. So the next question is, Generally speaking, within the banking industry, what specific changes still need to happen to create an optimally equitable banking system? Can you say the last name, equitable banking system, do you think it was? Yes. Equitable. Um, well, I think those are two different things. Equitable banking system is that you bank the unbanked as well as those you bank. And that's, I think, we try pretty hard to do that. Uh, you can open up an account. Uh, we have a we have two programs as an example. I think called Home Assist. If you want to buy a house, and you are of lesser means, or or you're in a community that could use help, we'll um, give you uh, at least part of your down payment and part of your closing cost. We have a unsecured loan program where you can borrow up to about five hundred dollars. It costs you five dollars to do that. So there are no interest fees. Those are the kinds of things you have to do we tr to eliminate payday lenders. That's where it's not equitable because payday lenders take your money and they ch charge you a lot and that's not so great. Um, there's another issue about uh, equitable life and that is one per the one percenters versus the rest of the world and that's more complicated. And I would be happy to talk about that if I had an hour, but I don't. So I'll just answer the question as it was asked. Thanks so much, Anne. Your answers have been really inspiring and super useful. Um, and we have one last question. So as a successful woman leader who seems quite conscious of your larger values, do you foresee an expansion in woman leading in the world and what impact might that have? Well, we are half the population. We're certainly as capable of leading as any man, and you're seeing more and more of it, but not enough. I mean, for for the 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 fact is, we're the ones that have the babies, and Jen are, are the uh, a in a family. 
And if you were uh, single all your life, you would still probably be the caregiver if you had a brother, if you had an ill mother or father or sister brother. So that's, uh, I, I don't think it's right, but it's true. So we need to work through uh, first a developed world where we can do better. Uh, systems within businesses which allow for women and men to take for others that there's sufficient child care help or elder care help that there you are being paid a, a good wage and that you have good benefits because if all that happens see more women and i have every hope that there will be many more women younger than I that do far better than I did and in a uh, much higher quantity. So I'm very hopeful. Well, thank you to everyone in the audience for such risky and interesting questions. As you clearly heard today, Anne Finucane is a true visionary and pioneer. Thank you for sharing your time, insight and inspiration with everyone today. We couldn't be more thrilled to honor you with our Social Innovator of the Year Award for your work past, present, and what we know you will continue to do in the future. We know everything has been 2D lately, but we promise that this beautiful award is in Anne's hands as we speak. And thank you for that. I have it right in back of me. Congratulations again, Anne, on behalf of all of us at UNH.